go ahead and grab a seat. Well, we're going to turn our attention to uh, God's Word now, and so if you have a copy of Scripture, you can uh, take that out. Uh, we're, I'll meet you there in a minute, but we're going to be in the book of uh, 2 Timothy. It's a letter in the New Testament, um, and uh, you can uh, find it there. If you don't have a copy of Scripture with you, you are welcome to use one of ours. Uh, you'll find those underneath one of the seats in front of you. If you don't own a copy of Scripture, you're welcome to take that home with you, and uh, we'd love for you to be able to have God's Word in your hands to be able to uh, look at that together. I'd love to just sort of set up what we're going this morning, um, just uh, as by way of um, uh, kind of refresh and a reminder, but we have um, been looking for the last couple of weeks, and uh, we're going to for the next uh, couple more, more weeks, uh, what we call our pillars. And uh, around here, we have uh, five of them. And um, pillars are a pretty important piece of uh, the structure in, in a building. And uh, my son, Levi, got some building blocks for Christmas. Um, they are these kind of uh, identical shape, just very simple kind of pieces of wood. Um, but it's incredible what you can build with these things. And he got, like, way too many of them. Um, there's, they come in these massive packs. And so we were building all sorts of structures and doing all sorts of uh, things. But um, it's, it's interesting. The higher or sort of bigger uh, that the... Uh, building gets, the more integrity needs to happen in those uh, kind of foundation, those, those pillars. And uh, I think we, you know, you understand the concept, right, that if, if, it's, if the structure is uh, going to have any integrity, if it's going to last at all, or if it's going to be able to, to grow, then the foundation of what it is uh, resting on must be shored up, must be sure. If the pillars go, then so goes everything else. And so for us, we have some things that are like pillars in our uh, as us uh, for as a church, and there's things that are most important to us, and that we want to embody, and we want to live out, and we want to uh, hold with value. And I've said, you know, core values, pillars, um, uh, essentials are uh, super helpful on a wall somewhere, but if that's the only place that they exist, then they're not very helpful at all. And so we don't want to just have these written down or on our website or sort of you know around. We want to live these things out. And so we're walking uh, kind of week by week through what are key and core values to us here at uh, City on a Hill. This morning, we come to uh, the pillar of unapologetic proclamation. Uh, we're talking about God's word this morning, uh, particularly not just um, esteeming or sort of holding God's word, but what are we doing with it? And the word that we use for that is proclamation. And uh, I, I was reminded and kind of thinking about a um, uh, a story in the Old Testament where uh, the people of God had been kind of turned away from the Lord for quite some time. And uh, there was a king, Josiah, uh, and it's recorded for us in 2 Kings chapter 22. He took the reign when he was eight years old. Uh, as, uh, he was uh, moved on to the throne. And uh, he reigned for 31 years in Jerusalem. And it says this in God's word about him. It says that he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, and he walked in the way of David and his, fa his father, uh, and he did not turn aside to the right or to the left. Uh, Josiah sort of broke the mold. There had been a string of, of sort of kings that had been leading the people of God away from the Lord, away from his commands and his um, uh, edicts and everything else that he had given them. And, and so you have King Josiah who is in on the throne and reigning, and it says in the 18th year of King Josiah um, that they began to build up and repair the temple. The temple had grown into disrepair. And at one point, somebody came to Josiah, a uh, high priest uh, came and said that he found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. And I think about this all the time because they lost the Bible. Like they didn't have the, it, for them it would have been the Old Testament scriptures. They did not have um, the Torah uh, it, they didn't have uh, these, uh, the Psalms of, of David and all these things that were kind of recorded for them. They had lost some of the, the book of the law there. And, and so they're doing some cleanup and they're trying to repair the disrepair of the temple. And they come across the Torah and they're like, where has this been? And they begin to read it and they're like, wow, we have strayed from these things. 
And the, the response, it's an incredible story, but the response, I mean, they begin to lead, uh, read it. And it says with Josiah, when he heard the words of the book of the law, he tore his clothes. And then they began to read it to the people, and they stood for hours, and they, they were so moved and, and shaped by this. And, and I think about that all the time. It's like, how does somebody, how do you get to the place where something so valuable, so important, so core to who someone, to who the people of God were, that they completely lost it? And I'll tell you how that happens. It happens just a little bit at a time, right? Uh, nobody went and hid that thing, and they're like, well, I guess it's gone now. We're not going to find it again. Like, it just, you know, it, it started maybe in that prominent place, and then maybe something else got put kind of next to it, and then, and then maybe it sort of got moved over here, and then some other stuff kind of came on top of it, and then it kind of got shifted, and then maybe it went out to, to get kind of cleaned or sort of repaired, and, and kind of, you know, and then it never kind of made its way back, and then, you know, time got passed, and then it got handed off to somebody else, and then over time, it got moved further and further to the peripheral, to the place that people didn't even remember that it was there. And I think about that all the time because I'm like, man, if the people of God, the Israelites, if they can move to this place, they have this temple, they have all this worship, this, this place, if they can get to the place that the book of the law is forgotten and it's lost, then how much more so uh, could we? Uh, how much more so is that a possibility, is that a reality for us that we would, in our own hearts here in this church and our families and the way that we uh, sort of treasure and respond to and live out the word of God, are we too able to make this same mistake. And so what we want to do is we want to shore up our foundation. We want to check the pillars. We want to make sure that this is still a pillar for us because I think all of these things in some ways, if not, if left unattended, uh, they tend to fall into disrepair. If uh, not practiced, they tend to be ignored. And so this morning we want to talk about what it looks like to uh, follow uh, God's word and to proclaim it and to preach it. Uh, and the way that we say it around here is this, uh, unapologetic proclamation, uh, kind of the long form version of this is proclaiming the authority of God's word without apology. Every word in that sentence is important. Uh, we believe and we desire to and we do, we proclaim the authority of God's word without apology. That is, we are not afraid of this. We're not trying to uh, explain it away or, or make excuses for it. We're letting the word of God speak, and, and we're placing ourselves under it, and we are uh, responding to it. And so this is what we want to do, and we're going to look at the passage uh, that we often go to for this truth, and it's in 2 Timothy uh, in chapter 4, verses 1 through 5. And so, again, if you have a copy of Scripture, open up there, and I'd encourage you to look at it uh, yourself. Let me read these verses that we're going to be looking at uh, together this morning in 2 Timothy uh, chapter 4. Uh, this is a letter from Paul to uh, sort of his protege, his disciple, uh, someone he's been mentoring and teaching. He entrusted him uh, with the ministry there in Ephesus, and he's writing uh, this letter to him to encourage him in his pastoral ministry and his uh, work there in, uh, in Ephesus, and this is what he says. Um, we'll, we'll put it on the screen. You can follow along as well. It says this, I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but have itching ears and they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions. And they will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. As for you, always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your uh, ministry. Uh, we want to hear from and see uh, what God has for us in his word this morning um, around the proclamation of his word. Before we go any further, let me just pray that God would uh, teach us as we study this now together. Uh, would you pray with me as I pray? God, we thank you for your word. And each week, Lord, we take time, we set aside time, we devote ourselves to time in uh, the scriptures. And Lord, uh, this is a gift to us. It is your revealed word to us. Lord, it speaks of your nature. It speaks of your, your works. God, it speaks of your plan for salvation and redemption. God, it tells us the future. It 
It says what is yet to come. Lord, it says what you've done in the past. And, and Lord, it, it says what we need to do now. And so, Lord, we want to place ourselves under the authority of your word this morning. God, as we hear this, would we be reminded afresh of, um, God, the truth that you have for us. And, Lord, I pray that you would impact our hearts and our minds as we uh, study this together. We pray this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, four truths about God's word that we're going to see this morning in this passage. Uh, and these are all imperatives, all things that need to happen uh, with the word of God. Here's the first one. It's this. We're going to see that the word of God must be preached. The word of God must be preached. Uh, we have here uh, this charge from uh, uh, Paul to Timothy. If we could, I'd love to just kind of get a running start at it. I don't think I have it on the screen, but maybe you can just kind of scan your eyes up to uh, verse 14 of chapter 3, and it says this, But as for you, continue in what you have learned and firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it, and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. The understanding here is he moves on to this charge. It's therefore, or because of that, or in light of that, I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word. Here's the thing, is that the word of God must be preached. And Paul, as he's writing to uh, Timothy, he could have used his own sort of uh, influence over Timothy. Uh, he had authority over Timothy. He was, again, the one who sort of uh, poured into him, raised him. He was respected by Timothy. Um, he was, Paul was the pastor who had helped plant this church in Ephesus. He had every reason just to tell Timothy, hey, Timothy, I got something that I need you to do, and you can do it because I'm telling you, you need to do it. Um, that's how it works around our house. Uh, hey, uh, I asked one of my children, hey, can you do this? Can you uh, kind of, why do I need to do that? Because dad said, right? Like that's, that should be enough. I'll give you more reasons, but, but I, I don't need to uh, because dad said it. Uh, Paul's writing, he didn't necessarily need to give more reasons, but he wanted to show Timothy the weight of it. Notice what he says here. I charge you in the presence of God and of, Jesus Christ, and of Christ Jesus, who is judge of the living and the dead and by his appearing and his kingdom. The charge to Timothy is based on three realities about Jesus. He's charging him based on Jesus' judgment, and he's already kind of spoken to this, but, but Scripture says that leaders, preachers, those who hold and teach God's word will be judged more strictly. Remember the words of Jesus. He says, if anyone leads a child astray, it's better if like a millstone is tied around his neck and then thrown into the water. That's a pretty harsh judgment. He's saying, listen, if you're going to teach the word of God, then you're going to be held to a high standard. And he says, listen, Jesus is the judge. And so this is why it's important. Listen to, based on Jesus' judgment. The second reality that this charge is based on is Jesus appearing. It says it by his appearing, that that is the blessed hope yet to come, that there is a purpose, it's all leading somewhere, that Jesus is going to return and he's coming back and, and we need to be ready for that. We need to look forward to that. We need to know how to live in the meantime. And so because of the hope that we have in Jesus' return, I charge you. And then third, because of Jesus' kingdom, the promise was made to God's people that they will rule and reign with him forever, that they will be in his presence, that they will... Be with him. And so this day is coming when his kingdom will be put into place. And again, we want to live out and see his kingdom even now. And so because Jesus is here and his judgment and his appearing and his kingdom are coming, we need to do what? We need to preach the word. And so this word here, this, this, uh, this call here, preach the word. Uh, that word preach, there's lots of words that Paul could have used when he says it, but this one has the connotation or sort of the understanding of a herald. You know what a herald does? A herald was someone who would bring good news or news. Often you'd hope it was good news, but that's kind of the idea here is it's, it's bringing the news, and this news in this case is the gospel. The gospel means good news, and so the preaching is one of herald, and I think that's a helpful distinction to make. You know, uh, a lot of uh, churches are moving toward this place, and I'm not trying to 
point to any in particular. I'm just kind of making a blanket statement. So if you're picturing one, that's on you and God. You can figure that out. But where a lot of churches are moving is kind of uh, 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 sort of a, a Christian version of Coldplay followed by a really helpful TED Talk, right? And that's kind of what it, church is sort of becoming is like, let's go to a Coldplay, Coldplay concert, listen to a TED Talk, and then we'll go about our week. That is not what we are called to do. We are called to preach the word. And so the preach is not necessarily, there hopefully is some application that comes out of God's word, and there's some things maybe that you need to do, but primarily what you're doing is you're telling the news of what has already been done. Like I'm sharing, as I'm preaching the word, I'm sharing with you what has been accomplished by Jesus already. We're preaching the word. And what is the word? Well, the word is what was just described in that verses that I just read right above. It's the scriptures. Uh, for Timothy, it would have been the Old Testament scriptures. For us, we know that the New Testament was still being written at this time, but it is the accomplished, finished work and word of God. And it says, all scripture is breathed out by God. It's profitable for teaching, for proof, for correction, for training in righteousness. This is the word of God. This is what we are to preach and to proclaim. And so what we do is, as as we preach, as we proclaim God's word, it's not based on preference or natural gifting. For Timothy, this would have been a matter of obedience. And for us, we want this to be a pillar in our church. And here's the thing that you have to understand. Is that I think more than anyone, all the other pillars, you're like, okay, I see myself, I need to worship, I need to pray, I need to witness, I need to, you know, these things. But we get to this one, and you're like, oh, that's what, isn't that what we hired Pastor Dave to do, right? Isn't, isn't that his job? Uh, to preach the word. And yes, it is. Like this, this time of preaching, this, this kind of weekly gathering and sitting under the proclamation and preaching of God's word is super important, but that's not all that it is. Again, this word here is herald or proclaim. See, here's the thing is you get to participate in the preaching and proclamation of God's word all the time. You can do that in your own life. You can do that in your own home. You can do that in your uh, sphere of influence and with the people that you're interacting with. And as you're especially with the people of God, you can proclaim and preach the word of God. You are called to this as well. I think that's super important that we understand that. So as you're reading it, don't just read, okay, that's what he or they or somebody else is doing. This is what you are called to do as well. You are called to preach the word. And when we preach, what are we doing? Well, we're not preaching ourselves. 2 Corinthians 4, 5 says, for what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, with ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. And we preach the whole counsel of God's word. Paul in Acts, he says, For I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole counsel of God's word. What we do is we let the word of God do the work. And so there is so much confidence that I have each week in standing up here, my job is to hold up and to kind of point to and shine a light on the, the Word of God, knowing that the Word of God has power to work. The Word of God has uh, the, the influence and the impact, and, and it's my job to just not get in the way. I need to let the Word speak and, and try and explain what is being said here. God works through the preaching of His Word. I think this is super important that we understand this, that this is not just a helpful talk, but this is the word of God being proclaimed. You see, the congregation, you are, you are not an audience. You come in here as disciples. You come in here as disciples seeking to learn and to follow your shepherd more closely. The person of Jesus. And I am not just a teacher or uh, as a pastor, I'm not a speaker. I am preaching the word of God. I am heralding the good news of what Jesus has done and who he is. And so one of the ways that you participate in that is the way that you sit under the word of God, the way that you respond to, that you accept, that you receive, that you interact with and engage with the word of God. And I think there is, uh, that begins with the disposition that we have kind of walking in, right? Uh, if you have a high view of scriptures and a, and a desire to hear what it is, then, then, then your whole attitude as you come into this place is, is kind of geared toward that. The way that you interact with it, I, 
Again, not everyone needs to take notes, though I think I've said before, I think there's um, extra credit in heaven for taking notes. I really do. Um, I can't find chapter and verse on that, but no, no, I'm joking about that. But I think what it does do is it helps maybe just to engage your mind or gives you something to go back and look, look back at. And so, again, whatever that way might be, if you're a digital note taker, that's awesome. If you're a paper, often we will have those scripture journals available so that there's an easy way to kind of take that down. But, but I would just encourage you to come in, pen in hand or, or kind of device in hand with the um, willingness, ability, readiness to, uh, to hear and maybe write down a few things. Less concerned with did you walk out with the outline, more concerned with did you walk out with the meaning and understanding and next steps from the word of God. That's what you're trying to accomplish. And one of the ways that you participate in the preaching of the word is by supporting the other ministries around it. Um, oftentimes what we see in scripture is that the, um, the preaching is, uh, is told to, to be held up in esteem and to be uh, protected. And, and uh, I, you know, I can share personally that my time is, is, is often, uh, all the time, kind of being fought over, over all sorts of things that pull in my direction. Yet always, every week, I have this, this constant desire, pressure, need to know that I'm going to stand up here and I'm going to get to preach God's word and I need to be ready to do that. And just full transparency, some weeks I walk up here much more prepared, much more ready, much more confident of what, and then other weeks, man, I wish I had another day or two. Right? I wish I had more time. So one of the ways that you can be a part of that is supporting that. But one of the ways then that you carry that out in your mind is in the same way that you're in and knowing and studying Scripture. And that's what the next point is. The Word of God must be preached, but the Word of God, in order to be preached, must be known. Notice what he says. He says, preach the Word, be ready in season and out of season. The idea here is all the time. Be ready when it's convenient and when it's not. Be ready when it's easy and when it's hard. Be ready when people are responding and when people are not, but you have to be ready. In order to be ready, the word of God must be known. You know, we've said for a long time around here, and we'll continue to say it, I don't think it uh, doesn't hold true at all, but uh, one of the things that we've said many, many times over the years is that people are not hurting for a lack of information, they're hurting for a lack of application. What I've seen so many times is that it's not that people don't know the word of God, it's that people oftentimes are not applying the Word of God. See, I, I still hold that to be true, but I think increasingly I'm worried that we don't know the Word of God. See, I don't want to just assume that, that we all have the information, that we've all spent time in this, and it's just a matter of applying that which we've already had. If we don't have it, then we can't apply it. And so that's one of the reasons that we wanted to kind of put this special emphasis this year on reading through the Bible together. And I've been so encouraged. So many of you are taking up the challenge with that plan. And uh, we have that five-day plan. It's available back there at the Connect Center or on our website. And so many of you are keeping up with it. And it's been fun to interact and know that there's so many of us kind of in the same spot. And um, if you're reading somewhere else in God's Word, I'm glad that you're reading. And so keep that up. Don't ever hear that, oh, man, I need to be reading over here. That's fine. Just know that there's a bit of a club that, that we're all kind of having and enjoying together, okay? It's kind of fun to be in that spot. And we intentionally put this as the third uh, week of this series because I wanted to use this as an opportunity to encourage you to keep going. I know some of you have maybe started your Bible in a year plan many, many times, and this is like your 15th time reading Genesis, but you've only read uh, Leviticus maybe you know, seven times and Deuteronomy only three times. Okay, I want to just encourage you, keep with it. To those of you that maybe have already fallen off the tracks. I know there's a handful of you that you're like, well, I had great intentions, really wanted to, but then like by day seven, I was already behind and I didn't know how to catch up. Okay, I've said it before. I'm going to say it again. You don't have to catch up. If it's easier, just, just go ahead and cross out those first few weeks and you just jump in. And tell you what, this week we're finishing up Genesis. We're finishing up Mark. If you want to just jump in with Exodus, get a head start on next week, you'll already be ahead. Like, you're like, man, I'm killing it. I'm already ahead. Like, I, I already got, you got buffer days kind of built in. See, it's not so much about, like, you have to read every single page. That, well, that's good, and that's what we're going after. I would much rather see you consistently in God's word, hearing, responding, thinking, meditating on it. Again, all scripture is breathed out by God. Can I just encourage you as we get ready to move through the Torah 
there are going to be weeks that you are going to be in Leviticus, reading about all sorts of laws and different things that you are like, I don't really, I don't see the connection. Trust me, there's great things there. You got to mine it a bit. But as you're going through, can I just encourage you with all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. Here's the really cool thing about God's word. I heard it said recently that, you know, if you were to read, um, you know, I don't know, like Lord of the Rings, and, and if you had Tolkien kind of with you sitting there kind of explaining, hey, this is why I said that, or this is what, you know, oh, I thought, isn't that cool how that, you know, and he's like, expl- how much like, more of an experience would you get reading something like that? You don't get that experience, right? You read the book, and you're kind of left to kind of figure out what the author intended or why he or she may have put that in there or what that means. Here's the awesome thing about the Word of God. As you read it, the author is in the room with you, and he is leading you into understanding as you read it. If you open up your pages of Scripture with that understanding, it changes everything. See, the Word of God must be known. He's telling Timothy, he's like, listen, it might be easy now, but, but a day's coming when it won't be, or you don't know what's like going to happen tomorrow. How many times have I found myself in a conversation where having the Word of God at my fingertips or, or memorized or different things was so helpful, or other times when it hasn't been there, and I'm like, man, I wish I had that down. I wish I had studied that a little bit more. And we need to be aggressive in overcoming obstacles with ruthless persistence when it comes to God's Word. Would this be the year, would this be the time when you make the commitment to be a man or be a woman of the word of God? Church, we need to study it. We need to learn and understand the themes. There are so many tools out there. If you're like, man, I need help, there are so many things that can help you understand the themes and the outlines. We need to memorize great passages. We need to have the word of God written on our hearts. We need to immerse ourselves in the things that are being spoken and written about, these stories. And we need to know the people of the Bible and walk with them. More than that, we need to know the God of the Bible. It is showing us a window into God himself. He has made himself known through his written word. And we need to get into it. We need to be a part of it. If you need some resources or need some help, I just want to put one more plug for there's a cohort that is um, chatting on our, uh, one of our platforms and kind of sharing insights or asking questions. And so that's available to you. You can find the sign up for that on our website. There's going to be an online Zoom gathering where they're going to kind of share and kind of reflect back on the month and look ahead to the month ahead. And so if you need uh, some others to do that with, I could just encourage you to, to do that as well. But the Word of God needs to be known. Be ready in season and out of season. This is for all of us. Faithful preaching puts the Word of God in its historical settings in the context of the whole Bible before applying it to today's life. If you don't know and understand the Word of God, it's really hard to apply it. It's so, so helpful to spend that time in it. Let's continue on. Let's see what he says next. Look back at verse 2. It says, preach the Word. Be ready in season and out of season. And then another list of imperatives, all kind of feeding into the preach the word. So this is all part of preach the word, but how do we do it? Well, we reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. Here's the third thing, uh, the third imperative uh, truth about God's word is this, that the word of God must be followed. It must be followed. It's meant to impact us. Jesus, some of the last words he said to his followers, he says, go make disciples baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And he says, teaching them all that I have commanded you. No, no, actually, did you catch that? I didn't say it right. That was intentional. He says, teaching, you to, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. See, here's the thing. Jesus intended to say that very thing. It wasn't just about teaching all that I have commanded you, but teaching him to observe all that I have commanded. The word of God is not just a book to be studied or or kind of themes to be memorized or, or, or to be known. It is a word from the Lord to be followed. It results in change and attitude and, and, and action. Who we are, what we do, the things that we say, things that we think, they're shaped by the word of God. Can I just ask you a super simple question? Are you allowing the word of God to shape you on a daily or weekly basis? How has the word of God changed you 
recently? Is there a time when you've been reproved by the word of God or rebuked by the word of God or exhorted by the word of God? This is what faithful preaching or faithful proclamation does. Let me kind of break each of those down a little bit. Reprove. When the word of God reproves us, it shows us where we are wrong. Another word that is often translated there is correct. We don't love, nobody loves, I don't think, being told that you are in the wrong, right? That your understanding or maybe something you're doing is not correct, but that is what the word of God is to do. It's to reprove, it corrects, it points out the error and changes direction, pointing the direction of where it should go. Faithful preaching will at times reprove. I'm not asking you to say it out loud or raise your hand or anything like that, but can you think of a time when maybe you've been in this room and you have felt the word of God reprove you? That you're like, no, I, you know what I'm doing right now, how I acted in that situation or my attitude toward that or, or the way that I'm going about this is, is wrong and I need to repent, I need to change. The word of God should do this in our life. Secondly, we see that it should rebuke us that's not just where we're wrong, but maybe where we need to stop. Is there something that is happening that you're doing that needs to cease? A rebuke is to, uh, to bring about a, a stop. And then thirdly, we see the exhort. That is, where do you need to keep going? Where are you wrong? Where do you need to stop? Exhort, where do you need to keep going? There's an encouragement that comes from the word of God. Keep after it. Don't give up. Don't stop trusting. Don't stop waiting. Don't stop hoping in this. I want to exhort you in this. Again, faithful preaching has all of this. It shows us where we're wrong, where we need to stop, but also where we need to keep going. And the things that are going well, the things that need to continue to happen. But notice all of it is kind of wrapped in this blanket of patience and teaching. You see that there? It says, with complete patience and teaching and teaching. God is so patient with us. Faithful preaching is patient with each other. We're not expecting, I'm not expecting, you shouldn't be expecting of yourself or others that, that you just get it all at once. Sometimes it takes hearing it multiple times. Sometimes it takes a little bit of change at a time to get there. But there is a part of it that is teaching. Uh, this is the didactic nature of preaching. At times, there are things that I'm trying to show, or as I, I open up and preach God's word, it's like, okay, Hey, let's remind ourselves of this, or maybe you've never heard this before, and so this is brand new for you, and so teaching is a part of it. We need to learn new things. And here's the thing. I think some of us, we, uh, when we graduated from, whether it's high school or undergrad or grad school, whatever that level of education was for you, uh, many of us were so excited to kind of close the books of our life. And, and some of you, that was the last time that you ever read a book. Um, can I just encourage you that uh, the reading is really, really good, and it's really hard to know and study and, and be in God's Word without actually reading it. There is an effort that is needed. So if you're like, man, what's the easiest, simplest way to do this? Uh, I know many of us are enjoying that audio Bible. That's great. That can be an awesome tool to help with it, but we need to engage with God's Word. We need to put our eyes on it. We need to kind of meditate on it, think on it. Can I just encourage you to Get after it. There is a teaching that comes in that. There's going to be some things that you're going to need to grow in that you don't know that you need to know. There's instruction that is needed. And all of this, though, is moving towards change for impact. My hope is that you are not the same person that you were a year ago. And many of you can attest to that. You can say, no, there's things a year ago. Or look back five years ago. Or look back ten years ago. You're not the same person that you were then. There's some things that have changed, some things that are different, some things that you're stronger in. Same time, there might be new, <laughs> new challenges or you've unearthed some new things or you've maybe picked up some new habits or some new decisions that need to be made. My hope is that a year from now, you won't be the same person that you are now. There's gonna be a direct correlation with how much you are in God's word and the way that you get into God's word, how much you're letting it impact you. The example is given in scripture of the potter and the clay, right? And in many ways, we choose how hard our forming is going to be to the potter's hands. 
right? When Jesus tries to shape us, how much are we going to bristle at that? How much are we going to push back? How much are we going to, you know, are we going to be pliable and moldable and allow him to shape and to smooth out those edges and, and change the contours of who we are? That is what the word of God is doing. Even now, my hope is today, can I just tell you one of my hopeful outcomes of this is that we would take and uphold the word of God even higher than when we came in today. We would walk out of here with a greater understanding that, yes, this is the final authority in my life. This is the supreme court of decisions in my life. There is nothing higher than that. That we would walk out with a greater respect and a greater desire to place ourselves under the authority of God's word. God can do that right now. There's something about God's teaching, the preaching of God's word that can shape us as we engage in that together. And fourthly, let's look at the fourth imperative. It's this, is that the word of God in order to do all this, must be authoritative. It is authoritative. The question is, is it authoritative to us? Are we allowing it or placing ourselves under its authority? Notice what it says here in verse 3. It says, For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but have itching ears. You get the picture, right? That like, uh, you know, if you've ever had kind of that scratch, or that itch, right, that desire to scratch, and then you scratch it, and you're like, oh, that feels so good, right? That's the idea, is that their ears are itching. They they need them. They're kind of of itching a bit. I need them scratched. What's going to scratch them? It's this. I need some different teaching. They have itching ears, and they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. As for you, always be sober-minded, endure suffering, and do the work of the evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. Here's the thing, Paul could see, the Lord had led him to believe, maybe he was already seeing it happening in the ministry now, but he says a time is coming when people will not endure science teaching. Have we arrived there, church? Are we there? We are for sure there, okay? We are living in a time when people do not want to endure sound teaching, but rather people have itching ears to accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions. But here's where we need to be careful with this verse, church. This was not written describing people outside. This was written to Timothy describing people within the church. He's saying the church is going to move in this way. People that claim Christ are going to move in this way. And they're going to walk away from the teaching that they once knew. And they're going to accumulate other teachers to suit their own passions. They're going to turn away from the truth. Notice it is the truth, not His truth, her truth, my truth, it is the truth. There is a truth. Do we know that? Is it still okay to say that? I don't think it is in 2024, right? That there is a truth, the truth. See, we follow the one who says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Listen, we don't define and we don't get to make up what truth is. There is a truth and it exists and it is found in the person and presence of Jesus Christ. It is found here in this word. This is the truth. And so we need to be careful when we try and go outside of it to find other things. Is all truth listed in the Bible? Is everything true listed in the Bible? No, okay? And that's not a heretical statement. It, the Bible says nothing about how to change the oil on your car, right? <laughs> if you want to change your oil, do not look to the Bible. It's not going to tell you how to do that. You need to get on YouTube. And uh, if you haven't been on YouTube, there's lots of helpful videos to change your own oil if you want to do that. See, all truth is not in Scripture, but everything that is in Scripture is true. Everything that this book speaks to is true, and it is authoritative on it. So the Bible says nothing about how to change the oil, so I have some freedom there to figure out what's the best way and figure out a true way and an untrue way to change the oil in my car. You do need to change the oil. I felt so bad I sold my car, one of my old cars, to a high school student that was in our student ministry. He didn't know he was supposed to change the oil. I didn't know I was supposed to tell him when I sold it to him. And so like four months later, I was like, hey, man, how's that car? I haven't seen you in it. He's like, oh, it, it, uh, I never changed the oil. <laughs> it just like just stopped. It's totally seized. Everything just stopped. You need to change the oil, right? But the word of God's not going to tell you that. So there's things that you need to know that you're going to understand that are not in here. But here's the thing. If God's word speaks to it, it is authoritative and it is true. We need to be careful that we don't turn away trying to find other things. We need to be careful. I think the picture that we have here, I, I don't know, my, my mind goes to the very first sin, Adam and Eve in the garden. When they looked at the fruit, they saw that it was what? It was desirable to the eye. It looked good. 
Like, man, that looks tasty. I, I think I want that. But it was a desirable destruction. It brought sin into the world. It brought the knowledge of good and evil. It brought separation from the one that created them. We need to be careful of things that maybe look good to the eye, but ultimately corrupt and, and destroy. See, would we have ears to hear the truth rather than shopping for a more desirable message? We need to be careful that we listen to the truth of God. And so the encouragement is this, that we're seeing this all around. We're seeing this happen, and this could happen to us. Again, if the people of God can forget and lose the word of God, how much more so can we do that? See, my fear is, is that we have a generation that is being raised up, that's being discipled more by TikTok videos, Facebook reels, right? Little 15 second, 45 second clips. That comes across that feed and all of a sudden it's like, well, man, I don't know. what. I think maybe everything I've been holding on to is wrong. I mean, I'm watching people turn just because of little quippy things that are being said. Listen, the questions that are asked around this book and support this book have satisfied some of the greatest minds in human history. This has endured for thousands of years. This is not some new, fangled, kind of made up, sort of outdated truth. This is the word of God, and we can stand on it. We can trust in it. And so if you find yourself in a place of doubt or questioning or, or you're, you're going down this rabbit hole, can I just encourage you to come back to the truth, to, to, to surround yourself with some people that can point to and answer some helpful questions because I don't want to see us slip away and kind of walk into this way. So how do we guard against this? Well, Paul gives the instruction right here to Timothy. This is a great verse for us to apply even today. He says, as for you, always be sober-minded. It means keep your head about you. Be careful, right? Hang on. Endure suffering. Expect suffering, and when it comes, endure it. Trust the Lord. Walk through it. Do the work of an evangelist. What does an evangelist do? An evangelist proclaims the good news of Jesus to all who will listen. He says, do the work of an evangelist and fulfill your ministry. Care for, shepherd, love people as Jesus has cared for, shepherd, and loved you. This is what we are called to do. Man, I think this would be a great verse to read in the morning. What am I supposed to do today? Well, here's where I can start. I'm going to be sober-minded. I'm going to endure suffering. I'm going to do the work of an evangelist. And I'm going to fulfill my ministry today. Tomorrow, what am I going to do? Well, I'm going to wake up. I'm going to be sober-minded, and I'm going to endure suffering, and I'm going to do the work of evangelists. I'm going to fulfill my ministry. If we keep these things in front of us, if we do these things, and this helps us down that path of, of listening and following and, and keeping after the truth of God, it needs to be authoritative in our life. Listen, church, we're living in a time when solid teaching, solid doctrine is being equated to harmful indoctrination. When you teach your kids the word of God, some out there would claim that you are, you are distorting their worldview. You're, you're, you're putting images or, or ideas in their head and not giving them the opportunity to explore it. Listen, church, will we not fall prey to these deceptive ideas? That there is a truth and we are called to proclaim it and teach it and share it to all who will listen, especially our children. Right? If you're a parent, teach them the word of God. It's not a promise, but it's a proverb. It says that, that when they're old, they're, if you train them when they're young, that when they're old, they won't depart from it. You can help protect them from a whole lot of heartache. And if you're questioning that, we can go around the room later and, and people can share how much more they wish that they would have known earlier about the truth of the word of God and didn't have to figure it out on their own by walking away from it or, or discovering it so much later. Right? The word of God has what we need the authority in our life. So church, this is how we treat, this is how we respond to, this is what we do with the word of God. Are we upholding it? Are we listening to it? Are we placing ourselves under it? Are we coming in here ready to hear? Obviously, yes, there's more than preaching that happens in this room, but what are we doing with the preaching that happens in this room? Are we coming ready to respond? I think we are. I think we are. This isn't a message. This isn't meant to be a, a rebuke or, hey, you gotta stop doing all the things that you're doing. I think this is more of an exhortation. Let's keep going, church. Let's not grow weary in hearing the truth or doing the things that God has called us to. He has so much for us here in this book. Let's mine it for all that it is and let's live it out with all that we are, knowing that he will bring about 
the fruit, the reward that comes in knowing him and his word. Let's pray. God, I acknowledge that there are times, days, or moments in my life where I forget just what a resource, what a tool we have in your written word. God, your scriptures are a gift to us, and, and uh, Lord, they are not just informative and instructive, but God, they bring life. God, they bring growth and change. Lord, I pray that you would help us to respond accordingly to what it is that you have for us here. God, that we would never move from or beyond the word, Lord, but that we would trust in, hope in, God, believe in the word that you've given to us. God, I also pray just that you would guard us from going the other way, that we would be so about the word of God that we miss the God of the word. And so, Lord, you are the reason why we are seeking scripture. We're not just trying to know about a book. We're trying to know about the author of the book. And so, God, as we mine these pages, as we study this together, as we discuss it in our groups, God, try and apply it in our ministries, I pray that we would see and know you better. God, I ask that you would teach us, that you would encourage us. God, where we are off, that you would correct us. Lord, thank you for loving us enough to do that. We pray this, we thank you for this in the name of your son, Jesus.